Hi and welcome. Thank you all for joining us for today's interview with Celeste Rains Turk. Did I say your name right? You did. Yay, cool. So Celeste, hi and welcome. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Happy to meet you over Zoom officially. I'm really grateful you're having me on. Yay. I'm so grateful that you responded and you came over. I've been listening to your podcast for a very long time. So this is really exciting to me. Um, so Celeste, can you share with our audience a little bit of a background, um, like your academic background and then your competition background? Sure. So I have my bachelor's degree in psychology and I am about to finish my master's in clinical mental health counseling. I just got my national certified counselor title thing um, after passing that exam. So we'll see what happens with that. Um, I decided to study these things because I originally started studying nutrition and dietetics and realized it wasn't for me. I actually really wanted to understand why people eat and help them to heal their relationship with food more than I wanted to support people in what to eat. And um, I had a passion for personal development that got me into studying those areas. And when I was in school, I just fell in love with the lifespan development, the psychology classes, the philosophy classes I took. So I was like, if I'm going to do school, I better do something I love because I've always been committed to doing what I love. And um, it, it just worked out really well for me too, because my background in competing, I started in 2015. I had just turned 18 uh, the year prior to that, well, I don't know. It was, a, I was around 18 years old and started in the NPC. I realized that bodybuilding was a bandage to a lot of the mental ailments that I was facing. It was an excuse for me to continue having negative relationship with food in my body. So I took some time off. I was a jaded competitor for a bit and then realized, no, it wasn't a sport. It was me. Worked on my personal development. That's what sparked everything into psychology and studying that. I decided, let's go back to the stage and show you can do it while maintaining a healthy relationship with food in your body. That's been my mission ever since. And I've done nine shows between now uh, 2017 when I came back to now and I'm in prep for my 11th. You're right. You are eight days out. I checked your Instagram this morning. Yes. <laughs> Which show are you doing right now? I'm going to do the Dennis James classic in Scottsdale, Arizona. Okay. That's so cool. So let's start, I guess. Oh, also, you forgot to mention the podcast. I think this is really important. Yes. <laughs> That's how I found you. Well, yes, I host Confessions of a Bikini Pro podcast, started that in 2018, just as a way to contribute to the bodybuilding industry. It was purely a passion project. It, I was not serving the competitor niche at the time, but it opened my eyes to the mission of build more than just a body, applying to bodybuilders. And that's when my whole business really shifted, but because of the podcast. And um, I also have a book, Believe Your Way to Badass. If you guys are looking for an interactive guide and journaling tool, that's a great thing to look up. You can find it on Amazon. I'm going to make sure that I link all those things in the description box so people can find them easily. Um, you are the expert on mindset. And this is one of my favorite topics, if not my favorite topic. <laughs> so we're going to delve very deep into that. But first, let's get out of like, let, let's get out of the way the little things like what your meal plan is like. What does it look like right now? Uh, is low right now. Like I am definitely in a steep deficit and um, we're doing like mainly it's a high protein, low carb, low fat diet. Uh, so a majority of what I'm eating is protein. I consume all meat based protein and dairy. That's what I like. I know you're a huge fan of, you are the carnivore diet queen. So ah. <laughs> I yeah. knew you'd probably like that. <laughs> yes. I was like, wait a second. That's, this is great. This is music to my ears. <laughs> yes. But I, um, it's funny cause I'm not, a, like, I don't love meat, but I, being a bodybuilder, not saying you can't do it other ways. Cause there are other ways, but for me, that's what I do, but I still eat carbs and fats. I like having a balanced diet. Um, but right now definitely in the low calories, we're depleting into this show. And then, um, my coach just called me this morning. He said at around on around Wednesday, 
we're going to rest and refeed into the show. So then we'll go up to more like recovery macros and um, that'll support my longevity because my season will probably be fairly long. So right, that's how it looks right now. And I eat throughout the day. I don't fast, don't do any of that. Um, I'm very Yeah, you can't consistent. when you're training. It's very difficult to fast, um, especially when you're training this hard, you know? Um, and also the more meat and protein one eats, I feel like there's less of a need to intermittent fast as opposed to if you're eating a lower protein diet, because then it would probably be a little bit more helpful for, for those people to get the benefits. Um, supplement wise, um, do you take supplements? I do take supplements. Um, taking, and guys, this is for me, but I'm taking Core Nutritionals Hard not sponsored. Um, <laughs> I'm taking boron, chasberry, um, vitamin D. And uh, there's definitely some other things in that handful. But I, do you do creatine or whey oh, yeah. protein or BCAAs? I do creatine pre and post workout five grams. So 10 grams total per day. If I'm not resting, I still take it. Or, or if I'm resting, I still take it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't do BCAAs as much as I used to. Sometimes I'll do it to mix in with my L-glutamine. That's something else that I take. Mm. Um, and then, but otherwise, no, I don't make that a consistent part of my routine unless I'm told to, um, although I have them. And then, yeah, I think that that's about what I take, at least in the prep right now. Perfect. And you, you said that you had a, a vast um, calorie deficit and that's necessary obviously to come in tight for the show it doesn't mean that you're doing this all the time and you do this for a short period of time and then you know how to get out of it with a reverse dieting um a well thought out reverse dieting period so but do you know approximately how much your caloric deficit is it a, like a thousand or more i'm around a thousand calories just to be straight up yeah no that's that's really honestly, what I find to be the most effective. Now, not everybody needs that. For some people, their bodies respond at a 500 calorie deficit. But I noticed that if your body does not respond very quickly to 500 calorie deficit, it can be a little demotivating when trying to be so scared of going at a higher caloric deficit. Because I feel like the general environment kind of scares you away from a larger calorie deficit. Like, no, be careful, don't, you know? And sometimes it can be more demotivating for somebody to go so slow on something that's already already slow by like by definition <laughs> you know weight loss takes a lot of time a lot of patience so but you know what you're doing obviously you're working under the supervision of a coach and everything is well thought out let's talk a little bit about the reverse dieting phase and how important that is and what are your plans this time around it's definitely important. Like you said, my plan is to follow and execute what my coach gives me to a T. So I just started working with a new coach and we're taking a macro approach in the past. I've always done meal plans with mm. some macro swaps, but now I'm full macro approach. So there's a lot of things that have changed. Like I started measuring my meat raw. I started weighing my vegetables. Never did that before. Started tracking. Like if I drink something that has like two carbs, I'm putting it in. And I never did that before. Um, so those are some recent changes I've made, but I want to make sure that we have all the data we need for me to be successful. And it's pushing me to be a better athlete. And I was ready to take on that challenge. I felt like this is what I need to step into the athlete version of me that's been dying to come out. So my plan is to do what I'm doing in my prep, but in my reverse and my improvement season with new expectations. I'm a huge, huge proponent of make sure you set different standards and expectations for yourself post-show and for your improvement season than in prep, because a lot of people try to stay as their prep version of themselves. Mm -hmm. You can't do that. You're not prepping for a show. It's an unfair expectation. So my standard is going to be to follow through on my macros, talk to my coach if I need changes made, be honest and open about it. And get to a place where I'm able to eat a lot more and maintain or build upon my physique in the healthiest way possible. Because I've come to realize, like, I like feeling athletic and lean and strong. Like, I want to be able to go on a hike, like a six mile hike, no problem. Or if I want to go on a run, I could go on a run, not feel held back by my body. So 
that is important to me. And do you know for how long you generally reverse diet? You, have you done it before? Yes. So okay. I've reversed out of shows before and sometimes I've taken a slow approach. Sometimes I've taken a faster approach. Um, sometimes I've been more focused on health and hormones that I've taken a throw shit at the wall and hope something sticks approach. <laughs> um, wouldn't recommend that one, but I don't know how this one will look. It's really dependent on what my coach is seeing and thinking will be best for me. In, in general, for those who don't know too much about competitions, though, what, what is like the standard, if you want, um, for reverse dieting phase? Oh, that's such a tough question. I wish that I was more professional in this realm to answer it from like what I've heard, though, what seems to be normal is whatever's best for the athlete is what's always the answer. And some coaches will say it's better to go straight to maintenance calories especially if you've heard that right mm -hmm. versus if you're doing a slow approach, you're extending the diet for longer. So you're extending your deficit, which means your recovery period could need to be longer as well. Hmm. But some people do that thinking, oh, it'll mitigate fat gain. Whereas others can go up to a maintenance and end up continuously dropping because they're on fire. I wonder, yeah, I guess it really depends on what athlete. And I guess we'd have to ask a coach who has trained a lot yes. of competitors to kind of get an answer as to what is best, you know, is it better to just go straight back up to maintenance like the next day? Or is it better to do that? Because yeah, like you said, if you're still in a deficit after a show because you're so scared to put on the extra pounds. You're still in a deficit. So mm -hmm. I don't know. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about binge eating, because I feel like that is something that you have struggled with, or I don't know if you want to label it as such, um, but you definitely have experience in that area. So can you share your experience with that? Yeah. So for me, binging looked like eating right or clean all week and saving up for the one day of the week that I could have cheat and I would wake up at midnight and I wouldn't go to bed till midnight and the whole time I'd be trying to get as much food in as possible and once I started it was like I could not stop and binging also for me looked like sneaking to the cabinet when people weren't around there we used to um, in my old family home we used to keep snacks in the garage like excess food so I would go in there and I would just open up Oreos and chips and anything that I could, literally anything I could find, even if I didn't like it, just to eat it. And I would eat it so quickly in hopes no one would catch me eating it. And this is horrible, but binging really, really gets to you mentally, especially when you're doing it in private or trying to hide it, which is very common and usually a criteria if you're going to be talking diagnosis. But anyway, like I would hope that people wouldn't be home or come home, which is so terrible looking back because I love spending time with my family, but the binging was like, so it was that important. And this would happen usually at least once a week, sometimes more for me, especially post-show in the beginning phases. Mm -hmm. um, like after my first show gaining 30 pounds in like two and a half weeks, you can imagine what was going on. Right. Um, <laughs> so I think, you know, for me, that's what it was, really. It was restriction, fixation, binge, restrict, fixate, binge, just repeat this cycle. And how did you get out of it? Or is it still something you deal with um, on, a, on a consistent basis? I could not tell you the last time I binged. And I'm so proud to say that. I think anybody can overcome it, honestly. And um, yeah, so the the way that I got out of it personally it was a lot of trial and error because I didn't know what I know now then <laughs> um but uh, I'm really grateful that there was trial and error because it's benefited me in helping others and of course then the psychology background the, the mental health background that's allowed me to apply even more like mm -hmm. literature research applica actual applicable tools outside of just the food tools I've created um, but some of the things that I did personally, I, one of my favorite tools ever is normalization through exposure. So there's a tactic called exposure therapy. You might be familiar with that mm -hmm. and using an exposure hierarchy, someone can overcome a fear 
in a productive and safe manner. And so I implemented that for myself without even really knowing what I was doing at the time. But um, I started with five chocolate chips a day and I would just eat five chocolate chips a day because I asked myself this one important question. I said, what's better, Celeste, 20 uncontrollable bites or um, consumption of this food, like 20 uncontrollable pieces of this or one every day, one every day. That would feel much better because the 20 uncontrollable leave me feeling so bad, not just mentally, but physically. So that question was what actually inspired me to start the five chocolate chips a day. And that put me on track to normalizing it. There were some days where I forgot about them. I didn't care about them anymore. I no longer was running to the cabinet to down, you know, as much as I could um, or, or hide them in my pocket. So that was one of the things that I did. Um, at, at first, I kind of took like a, I'm just going to allow myself to eat whatever I want, do whatever I want, let my body be. That was way back. That was after my first show. Um, that's like not in, necessary. Though. Intuitive eating. Yeah, intuitive. But <laughs> the reason I say it's not necessary and that was in the beginning is because I don't necessarily believe in that approach. Although I used it at the time because I thought that that would work for me. Um, I find that after a restrictive diet, people aren't prepared to intuitively eat. Like, how do you know when you're hungry or full or um, what's satisfying you when you've not paid attention to it for weeks or months on end? So that's a big thing is that I also started doing is I started paying attention to my body's signals and cues so I could strengthen the communication between my body and me. Uh -huh. um, and I started actually thinking positively about my body. So another thing that supported me in this journey was what if I were to love my body? What would that really look like? It was, it became more of, um, of action. So more of like nourishing myself movement that feels good, um, respecting when I feel too full or too hungry. So that was kind of where the intuition started to get stronger. And then when it came back to dieting time, I made changes. So what I noticed caused problems from previous dieting, I changed. So I didn't allow myself to become too restrictive. So I incorporated other foods, more of a variety. Mm. Um, if I had like a free meal, I made sure it wasn't like me going overboard. It was me eating a comfortable amount. I paid attention to why I was eating what I was eating outside of because I'm on a diet or my coach told me to, or I have a competition, more deeper reasons. And all of those things are tools that I still use with my clients now, um, but you know, they've expanded quite a bit, but for me personally, that's a lot of what, what I did. Yeah. And I feel we can talk for hours about the mindset tools because there are so many different techniques and tools and beliefs you can work on depending on every person's situation. So it's a lot of work, but clearly it's something that can be done and people do it all the time. Um, and I think experience is the biggest thing, experience and intention, like being experienced with competition, you know, because I feel like almost everybody botches their first competition and they like put on all the pounds right after and it's like, how did this happen? And then, and then that kind of grabs their attention. So like the next competition, they're better prepared. So I feel like that, you know, pain, um, the experience is like huge, the more you do it. And then the intention, obviously you want to, you don't just want to do all the competitions. You want to get better and better with every competition. You want to bring your better package and you want to enjoy the process. You don't want to burn out because yeah, everybody can get like the best package, but if you burn out at the end of it, you know, then you, you won't have longevity in the sport. So yeah, I, I'll probably ask you some more stuff about those things, but I wanted to ask you something that I forgot to ask you in the beginning, which is, did you ever struggle with weight before choosing to do the bodybuilding competitions, like growing up? Yeah, definitely. You did. I was always the bigger girl in school, like, uh, from pretty much like from third grade on, I didn't fit in limited to Abercrombie and Fitch. I didn't fit in any of the cool stuff. But <laughs> Hollister jeans, no way was that. Yeah, that was not jeans happening. do not like curves. No, no. <laughs> and like, I was developing faster than a lot of the girls in my age group, but I didn't see it that way. I just saw those bigger. And um, I, I was like, a, my dad would call it husky. So like, I was like a huskier kid and he had that face too, you know, but like, 
I think a lot of kids go through a phase like that, but for me, I saw it in a ridiculed way and I never will forget this, but you know, the show Full House. I've never watched it. I've heard of it, but I've never watched it. Yeah. So maybe the people who have like watched it would remember this, but Aunt Becky, the one who got in trouble recently um, in like the college scandals. But anyway, she. Um, oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so she was pregnant in the episode with tw- uh, like twins or triplets. Now I don't remember that part, but she looks down and she goes, you know, you're pregnant when you can't see your toes. And I remember looking down in the shower later and I was like, I can't see my toes. And I was like nine, you know, like I was really young. And I took that as like, oh, that means I'm fat. That means I'm as big as someone who's pregnant with like multiple babies. Now, granted, that was, you know, that's not true, um, but that's how I took it. And I remember that really changed how I saw myself in addition to things like the biggest loser and um, certain food rules that were implemented in my house. Now, we were never restricted, which is great, um, but some things that would be said or some actions that would be seen, it was, it impacted me. So I did struggle with it quite a bit. And it was, um, I was always an athlete my whole life. So that was good because that kept me like seeing and connecting with my body differently, seeing what I could do, how I could perform. And that mindset's important. And uh, sixth grade, we had mile tests. And I remember going into sixth grade, I thought, I don't want to be the last, I don't want to be the slowest person to run a mile. I'm an athlete. So I spent all of that summer going into sixth grade running and training and I grew and I leaned out and I'm like, bang, who is this person now? Cause that's when puberty was like really like intense for me too. Um, and I think I got a lot of discipline and willpower at that time, but it looked unhealthy at that time too. Like I had disordered eating patterns from a very young age. Some of the diets I would do or restriction I would fall into. So yeah, it was definitely a problem for me before yet these days, you know, the days where I learned what I wanted to do to help other people. The disordered eating would be like, similarly to what you struggled with in the initial also phases of competing, you know, the restriction and then the binging. Yes, except when I was little, it was like, I'm just going to eat this food and this food. And then when I was in high school, it was like, yeah, that's when the binging and restricting was like major because I was following plans that were like, you know, like bodybuilding.com. And then I hired a coach who was giving me a super restrictive plan. And I thought that's how you have to eat to look a certain way. Um, Mm -hmm. that would restrict certain nutrients or, or types of food groups that I needed at the time as an athlete, like most, like I was so active. I can't believe that I even was as successful as I was given how little I was eating, but yeah, that's when it started. Yeah. I feel like that's also a common experience, at least for me, it was, it was like that. And a lot of my girlfriends at the time, now that I think back, like we would all participate in the cycles together, (laughs) restriction, and then binging on, uh, you know, whenever we'd had like recess in between classes and stuff, Mm -hmm. you know, all the Nutella and like would share it. And then we'll we'll finish that and be like, let's buy some more. (laughs) Let's buy some more. Mm -hmm. Um, So I do remember having the same exact experience as you. So what about emotional eating? Um, It's, I guess you could say it is a little similar to binge eating, but not just quite the same. Um, What are your experiences with that? So emotional eating, I like to look at it as like void filling um, or avoidance. So usually when someone experiences an emotion and they're not comfortable facing that emotion or they don't want to, their mind is going to find some way to cope with it. So a lot of times people say emotional eating is bad. I like to change that perspective just a little and say, maybe emotional eating is the only tool you have to cope with this. So you're doing the best you can. That's a compassionate approach. So I think having acceptance is important. And then once we can see that, we might say, well, what would be better for me? So there's this activity I like to have people do where they identify Um, they identify a mood that triggers the desire to eat. And then they identify other things that could create or evoke uh, the opposite mood. So let's say someone's feeling sad. They want to feel happiness, relief, peace of mind, uh, clarity. So then we might say, what else could create those things other than the cookies that your brain has created a shortcut to go to? 
well, then they might say, well, meditation or talking to a loved one or journaling. So we come up with healthier coping strategies um, to support actually facing and validating the emotion. Mm -hmm. Um, As you know, with my background in mental health counseling as well, I love DBT skills. One of the huge skills is self-validation. Yeah. We cannot validate ourselves those emotions feel really scary and heavy. So turning to something like food is also a way, like I said, it's not just to fill the void, but it's also to avoid the emotion. So we might avoid uh, the pain of deep sadness or the pain of not feeling good enough or the pain of regret or the pain of being hurt by someone in our life. We might avoid that by turning to food because it shuts us off. Is there a place also for just white knuckling it you know um not always but sometimes you know because I feel like sometimes um it's going to get tough actually as you get closer to a show especially if you're competing it is you are going to have just some tough moments now if it's like excruciatingly painful then there is something deeper right at, at work and um you know you you have to you have to like dig deep um and go through all the exercises but do you would you recommend or like your experience with just like pushing through cuz there will be painful moments whenever you're trying to accomplish a goal, right? So what, what are your thoughts on that? What is your take and you personally, like your mindset while prepping for a show or like achieving a goal? What do you do in those moments? In general or when there's a desire for food? When there is a desire for food. Hmm, that's a really great question because I'm not um, anti-pain. I'm very much pro increasing pain tolerance, mental pain tolerance, that is. So like, let's say you're in a deep deficit or competition prep. We, we, I like to say, accept what we expect. So if you can accept what you can expect, if you can say, I expect that at this point in time, I'm going to have more food fixation. Naturally, your body is going to fixate on anything that's in lack in your life. So when the pandemic happened and there was no toilet paper, what did people do? They rushed to the store to get toilet paper. Just to take it out of context, no matter what, if there's something lacking, that's what we fixate on to meet our needs. So when something like food is lacking, you're going to fixate on food. Accept that. It's part of the process. It happens. You can accept it. It'd be much easier to then white knuckle if you want to take that approach um, or at least to face it. So that's one thing, you know, be mindful of the types of red flags or things that'll come up at that point in time, that'll already ease the pressure. Because when you do experience, you're like, I knew it was possibly going to happen. I knew it was going to come. We want to create mechanisms that are going to be in place during your prep to support you when those things come up though. So if you find that you're having food fixation or that that could happen, we want to say, well, what would make it about food or always talking about food with people that could potentially increase the fixation so Mm -hmm. want to you know address that I'm not a fan of necessarily white knuckling it when there's solutions that are possible so you know you could white knuckle it and it might increase your pain tolerance but you made a really great point earlier you said you don't want to get off the stage having looked your best and then have no nothing left to keep going and give to yourself and like recover and come out and, and keep going. You want to enjoy the process. So part of enjoying the process is making sure you're putting just enough pressure on yourself to make it difficult and challenging and therefore fulfilling, but not too much pressure where you want to run away and not commit to it. And that little bit of pressure each day is what's going to increase our pain tolerance. You have to have pain tolerance in a sport like this. You have to. And I'm not talking physical, people give me shit for this, but it's like, you're, I'm not talking physical pain or illness. Talk to your coach or doctor about that, not me. I'm talking the mental urge to say, I'm giving up. Ugh, I don't like this. This is hard. Yes, we need to be able to apply more pressure at that point. Um, so that's kind of my take on the white knuckling. Don't do it if there's solutions possible. Make sure we explore solutions first. Once yeah. you have applied those solutions, accept that, okay, you can expect this is probably normal at this point. 
Yeah, yeah, you don't have to make it unnecessarily difficult for you, you know, make it as easy as possible while at the same time remembering that grit and discipline is like the biggest determinant of success overall in life. So you got to always like never try to take all of those other things as um, hacks, you know, or as solutions so that you avoid ever having to practice discipline they can all coexist. Um, and I've noticed like when people who do the best with shows and competitions, they have all of those things in place, you know, that the discipline is always like kind of like at the center or like always existing, but at the same time, they're making it as easy as possible. Like they're meal prepping, they're, you know, on schedule, they're waking up earlier, they're doing all those things. And all of the, the tips that you mentioned as well, those are all the crucial, like how, how do you work with your brain to stay on plan without breaking yourself, like you mentioned earlier. So yes, exactly. Yeah, great points. Um, you know, I was listening to an interview that you did earlier. Um, and let me see if I still have, no, I can't find it right now. Um, but you did an interview like a year ago with another competitor and you were talking about cycles and periods and how a lot of competitors lose their cycle. Um, and have you had a personal experience with that? And where are you with that? And what is some advice you can give those who might want to compete, um, both like physically and mentally to prepare for the possibility? Oh my God, girl. <laughs> yes, this has been a struggle for me. Oh man. And it didn't help that I had such an extensive dieting history from growing up. Um, but yeah, that was definitely a big struggle for me. Something that a lot of women might not realize about this sport and, or, or it's normalized where it's like, oh, it happens to all athletes and competitors. So don't worry about it. Mm, just because it's normal doesn't mean it's good. You know what else is normal? Obesity. Not meaning it's good, right? right? right. So I think it's important to when you're getting into the sport, mentally prepare yourself for the potential loss. And when we lose something, we grieve something. And for me, my experience was that of grief. And, and it was so frustrating because I lost my period for like over a year. I did everything I could to get it back, which mean, meant I gained a lot of weight. I was doing things like seed cycling or following the period repair manual. And I did too much all at once. So I gained a lot of weight. I felt even worse. I think that put more pressure on my body probably. Um, and I just felt lost and I was taking different supplements. I was really trying my best. Well, I was at a loss and then I ended up going to the doctor at one point and they gave me progesterone and that got my period back. I did like a 10 day oh, yeah. cycle, got my period back. Well, it was fine, but it was fake. So a lot of those things end up just kind of creating a fake, uh, it's a false positive essentially. So it happened again, lost my period for my next prime. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is getting frustrating. I want to have kids one day. I'm a natural athlete. I'm doing the best that I can. I know as a natural athlete and as an athlete in general, you're going to push yourself a lot. So then I was really frustrated and um, go and I'm doing everything that I can again. And I'm taking a different approach. It's not working. Go back to the doctor because I'm feeling hopeless. This was a few years after the first experience. They give me birth control. And I always said I wouldn't take that. Mm -hmm. And I should have trusted my gut. I don't know why I took it, but I did. And I didn't even finish one round. I got extremely depressed and suicidal. Like I found myself at a park thinking about death. And I was like, whoa, this was the only variable that changed. So I immediately threw that shit away. I was fine. I got back and I was like, okay, hello, she's back. Um, yeah. <laughs> So didn't take that. Um, then I ended up, actually the coach that I'm working with now, Adam Atkinson, he offers lab reviews and he's so good. I sent him all my lab work. Well, actually I had him on my podcast for the coaches series. And then he was so kind and he's like, I want to say thank you. I'll review your labs. I was like, okay, we'll see. So I sent it to him. He reviewed my labs. He gave me feedback, told me exactly what to do not even three months, I have my period back and I've had it ever since then, thanks to him. And, um, so what did you do? A supplementation. And he challenged me to change some of my RPE in my workout and oh. reduce some training volume, but I was working with a different coach at, at the time. So once I stopped working with them and I was doing my own programming, I implemented those changes. Um, right. but yeah, he, it was mostly supplementation. I don't remember exactly what supplements, I think we break it down in the inner health 
series episode I did with him. Um, but yeah, I, and it's going to be different for different people too, like the amounts, but yeah, that was game changer for me. And I'm supposed to get my period tomorrow. So let's see if it comes. Um, if it doesn't though, I now know and have relief that I can get it back. And that is a mentality that feels relaxed as well. Like, no, you have a plan. So natural supplements is like that. It was the major thing plus lowering the volume of the workout. Yes. Very interesting. And every time you've competed, you've never done it on a keto, right? Or like a high fat um, diet. It's always been low fat. Yes, I would say so. I mean, in my improvement seasons, I can get my fats. I think I would bring my fats up fairly high. But in preps, um, my previous preps, I'd say it was around 40 grams. Currently, I'm around like 30. So I don't know that we're ever going to dip below this really. But yeah. yeah, I've never tried it with yeah. super high. Yeah, the only thing that I can say is that if you ever struggle with that in the future, you might want to play around with the macros and do more of a keto. It doesn't necessarily even have to be like clinically keto, just like a higher fat. The issue though is obviously um, the volume of the food. You know, when mm-hmm. you're prepping and you're doing keto, um, it's a little bit trickier because then you have to find a way to increase the volume of your your intake you know or obviously I like my audience knows I don't know if you you've checked it out a little bit now you know I'm the carnivore queen I like that label I'm gonna (laughs) wear it with pride yes (laughs) I do think that um, a carnivore diet is like the optimal human diet and it could be obviously high in fat because if you're only eating animal foods, you you want to get fuel from somewhere. So ideally, you want to get them from the fatty um, portions of those foods. I haven't found a competitor who's doing strictly carnivore yet, except maybe um, that one guy you had on. Yes. Uh... Oh, this is so embarrassing. Here, I'll find it for you. Okay. I was, uh, it was okay. because I literally was just listening to this too. Um, because I was like, oh, I'm really Kevin Stock, Dr. Kevin Stock. Yeah. The so, dentist. Yeah. Well, that, so he doesn't compete, but he could. Like, he's shred. There was a competitor you had though, but maybe he wasn't full, full carnival. No, he wasn't. Full, like, yes, yes, but still still a few other things like the keto brick, like not clean, super strict with carnivore, like only, you know, like nothing artificial, no, nothing um, outside of that. So it's, it's, there's still like avocados and things like that involved. Um, I would also say that Dr. Kevin Stock, the dentist who I interviewed not that long ago, he did lose the weight um, doing more of a meat lean meats and filler veggies like that's how he really dialed down the fitness and and got into like phenomenal shape and then from there he was just maintaining and then and then just started carnivore just so that he can have better you know mental like brain power so he can run all the businesses and do everything that he does so it's definitely a lot easier to maintain because you're eating more food. So it's much easier to maintain on a carnivore diet, but I have not found a single person yet that has like cut down on body fat, you know, like, and I'm talking competition. Obviously there are tons of people, which is why I love the carnivore diet, like tons of people who have, you know, they're no longer food addicted. They're no longer thinking about food every second of the day. And they're just, just doing carnivore. They've lost tons of weight. Some of them get abs, but like to do this in, in, in a competition way with a high load of, of training, because that's another thing when you exercise as great as we love exercise, it actually stimulates your appetite. Mm-hmm. You see? So that's what I'm trying to find out from people and this is why I try to like ask those questions kind of dig deeper to see you know how if if anybody has done it that way Um, I'll start looking too because if I find someone I'll let them I'll send them to you Um, oh please do yes yeah and vice versa especially if you find a bikini pro because then I can have them on mine too Absolutely. Yes. I, I, I love this topic, obviously, which is why I try to get people. And now more so, like I've, I've just started getting more people who are competing um, on my YouTube. So 
absolutely i'll keep you in mind awesome yeah um let's talk a little bit about the importance of posing because i feel like especially if you're not in the bodybuilding world you don't realize just how important it is to pose it's not just a lot of working out and the food stuff and the mindset it's also posing so what is your experience been like with that best thing I could say is pose every day even in your improvement season and have a posing coach or study the mo if you're good at applying what you see apply what you see but study and study the top pros um pose along with recordings of shows so if you can look up like npc show 2022 or whatever and then go along with when the judges say to walk to the back come to the front practice along with those things so you get the show feel um and you can time it better uh, I say pose every day because you're going to have to get comfortable in heels. And I think posing is also a great way to expose yourself to seeing your body in different shapes and sizes, which can help to reduce, like not reduce discomfort in the changes that we see as bodybuilders. So that's why I think posing in your improvement season is also important, even though you're not going to be making those minor tweaks, you're at least seeing your body changing. You're able to focus on the goal that you have. It keeps your mindset in the right place of like, this is my goal. Even if it's, I don't think we should ever really have a timeline, but even if it's not for another 15 months, it's important that I'm posing because that's where my mind's at. I'm thinking about version of me in nine months who's in prep and wishes that she would have been posing well that's why you do it today so that's what i would say as far as the posing goes make sure it's a consistent habit once you get it into your routine even just five minutes a day it's hard to break that type of a habit yeah you could habit stack it right like if you mm -hmm. have you read atomic habits from james clear i haven't read it but i believe in habit stacking yeah yeah, just, you know, after like your workout, a lot of people do that, especially if your gym like has a room, that would be great. You can just take your shoes with you and do it there. Um, how do you do it? Pretty much exactly like that. So I go and do my fasted cardio. As soon as the fasted cardio is done, I pose and then I come home. If there's a class going on for whatever reason, I'll pose later. Like I'm planning on going tonight to a different gym. They have a stage actually. So I'm going to practice on the stage. That's really fun for me. What gym has it? That that's great. It's called Vasa. Where yeah. is it? Um, I think they're primarily in Arizona and Utah. So I don't know if they're expanding, but yeah, they have a stage and it's so it's so cool because they teach like classes in there. So the class instructors are on the stage and I'm like go in there when there's no class going on. And yeah, so some oh, days I, I do that. that. That's mm -hmm. wonderful. Wonderful. Um, and um, your workout, I, I, I don't think we covered that. So you do fasted cardio right now. I guess this is like a different workout than what you would do in the improvement season. Right. So right now, um, your you, how is your workout right now in terms of prepping and being eight days out? Uh, well, it's so different than past preps, which is really cool. Um, I've actually been training four days a week only. So like I lift four days a week okay. um, and that's a different split. So I have like a one, three, five, and seven. So like week one, week three, five, seven, and a week two, four, six, eight. And those workouts are different and I alternate uh -huh. um, and I do four days a week, a uh, combination of, you know, bikini focus things, shoulders, glutes, but with this programming, there's a lot more compound lifts, which I'm loving. Um, and I miss that in my previous programming. And then I do, I like doing my cardio facet. I have a very busy schedule. So me knocking it out first thing in the morning gets me in that zone. It feels better for me, um, especially when there's a lot of it. And if <laughs> the days that I've had to break it up throughout the day, oh my gosh, it drives me crazy because I just feel like the whole day, all I'm doing is thinking about how much more cardio yeah. I got to get done. So yeah, I like to knock it out fasted. Is it a requirement? No, my coach wants me to do like an hour at least fasted right now. And then the other hour can be whatever, but I just get it done. So yeah, I'm doing like two hours cardio. Um, yeah. 
four days a week. Yeah, training. this is what it takes. This is something that a few people don't realize. And not only do they not realize it, those who do, there is also this idea like, you know, you shouldn't be working out this hard. But as a novice, as a beginner, sometimes you have to work as hard, except like if you are just maintaining from show to show. Like I know I watch also um, Ashley Kaltwazer's podcast and she she doesn't, you know, she doesn't, uh, she literally maintains like from show to show, but she's already had like, you know, decades of muscle building. So now she can do that and she can just lift weights and not necessarily um, do the two hours of cardio, like barely do any cardio. So it's really important that we remember that it's it depends really on your history and how much muscle you've built throughout your career. You know, then yeah, it gets easier eventually for sure. But in the beginning, yeah, there's a lot of work. It's, it's hard work. It is not for the faint of heart. You know, we all want to have the great physique, the perfect body. But once people really realize what it takes to get there, like, you know, that's that's a test for like how much do you want it. Yeah, exactly. Because your lifestyle is going to look very different than like a full on competition prep. And sometimes it requires you to push really hard and deplete really hard. But you also recognize that the other side of that, there's probably like refeeding, whether that's through resting, recovery, food, or reduction of cardio. Like as an athlete, you have to accept all phases of the process. If you want to accept what it takes to get lean, you also have to accept what it takes to build. It's you got to yeah. respect the whole process, really. Yeah. And so your cardio sessions right now, they don't necessarily, are, are you, do you push yourself to like increase the speed or is it just about um, kind of like maintaining and get, getting that caloric burn, especially when you're at eight weeks out and like the fatigue is a little bit higher, right? So how, how do you approach it? Um, I like to push myself each time a little more if I can. I <laughs> that know. might be amazing. It. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's hard. You know how it is. Like, I think a lot of athletes have that. Um, because I'm like, well, I, I like to always say I'm prepared for this. Like, I'm prepared for the next difficulty because if I've been training at let's say 100 minutes and I'm told now you're doing 120, well, I'm prepared for that, so it's fine. I'm gonna push myself. Right. Um, but yeah, I like to, I might do mostly steady state right now. So I do like walking on an incline. I do elliptical on an incline and I will throw in stairs randomly if my legs are feeling recovered and good. And uh, if I, if I notice that my effort is lacking, then I will stop my cardio session if it's been an hour and I might come back later because I want to maintain the intensity, but that yeah. doesn't happen often. Usually I'll just like move to another machine that gets my mind different. Um, but that's like my focus now, if I have a thought about lowering the speed or lowering the incline, I bump it up as a way to push through that pain tolerance and kind of change my mentality around that and show that I'm capable of more than I think that's made a difference in how I then approach each day. And I track everything that I do so I can look back and say, oh, I was doing X, Y, Z minutes on the treadmills and level incline. And this was my speed. So now the next day I want to do that. Wonderful. And so, so cardio, is it every day now? So lifting is four days a week and cardio every day? Um, cardio right now is six days a week, but I, I'm going to get my peak week plan in the morning or mm. tonight. And he told me that the goal is to like, we're going to push really hard on cardio for the next couple of days. And then after like Tuesday or Wednesday, he's going to basically just have me do what I did after my last show, which was recovery macros. So huge bump in calories, huge decrease in cardio and just cruise into the show, which mm -hmm. sounds, sounds like such a relief to my body, honestly. Um, but I'm willing to do the push. So then we can like the body's ready for the recovery. Yeah, yeah, because you don't want to have too much inflammation in your body on stage and you don't want to be doing tons of like intense cardio and have all that water retention um, when you're going to step on stage the next day or two days later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, well, I think I've asked pretty much everything that I wanted to ask you. What, do you, what would you say uh, is your biggest advice for people who are thinking about competition, what would some words of wisdom be? <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny you asked me that because I always ask my guests and I'm like, I never actually thought about it. <laughs> See? <laughs> uh, okay, let me think about this because, you know, advice is a difficult thing to give. 
but I think the biggest thing that I would say is have very clear standards and intentions for yourself in whatever season you're entering. So you can have the most fulfilling experience and remove the timeline. So rather than going into it thinking, I want to do a 12 week prep, I want to do a competition for the first time, I'm going to commit to 16 weeks, remove the timeline, make it about living the lifestyle, make it about establishing habits, becoming a version of you you're really proud of, happy with, satisfied in, one that is able to live life and feel really good. So that would be my advice is, is be very clear with the intention and the standard and do not have a timeline. Timelines are what make us usually doubt ourselves or question if we'll be ready or, and it, it takes away from the experience. It's much better to execute day in and day out, make this a habit. The rest will take care of itself. Great, great words. Thank you so much, Celeste. Yeah. Where can people find you and connect with you? Well, you guys can go to my Instagram, celestial underscore fit. That is the same across pretty much every platform, YouTube, um, Pinterest, if you're into that. And yeah, pretty much everywhere. Uh, and then if you guys want to listen to a podcast, Confessions of Bikini Pro is on everything, or you can ask your Google, Siri, or Alexa to play it for you. And um, like I said, Believe Your Way to Badass is on Amazon. And then I have tons of free stuff on my website. So celestial.fit, you can find a free food relationship coaching series, a free post-show personal development program. Uh, you can find free downloads, affirmations, journal prompts, legit so many things there. I just love putting out resources and I pretty much blog like almost every day. So you can find at least five blogs a week, probably. Um, most of the times it's more. So that would be my next recommendation is my website. Perfect. And I'm going to link all of those in the description box below. So everybody just go in there and check them out. And Celeste, thank you so very much for doing this. I am so happy we got to chat and to meet you for the first time. And for everybody, thank you for sticking with us till the end. If you like this kind of content, give it a thumbs up, subscribe, and make sure you hit that little notification bell icon so YouTube alerts you every time we post I post a new video. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next one.